Welcome to the Divorce Podcast, where we explore all aspects of ending relationships, separation, and parenting apart. If your marriage or partnership has ended, or you have friends and family who are separating, this podcast is for you. I'm Kate Daly, a relationship counsellor, divorce specialist, and co-founder of Amicable, the online legal service for separating couples. In each episode, we look at relationships and separation from different angles, including the emotional, legal, and social. I'm joined by experts and special guests who share their own unique stories, experience, and tips with the goal of helping people end relationships in a kinder and better way. In this episode, I was joined by financial planner Louise Oliver and divorce coach Tosh Britton to discuss adjusting to a new lifestyle post-separation. Louise has worked in the financial services sector for over 30 years and is a certified financial planner and chartered wealth manager. Throughout her career, she has regularly featured as a financial expert in the media, including across the BBC, GMTV and local radio. As well as being a divorce coach, Tosh Britton is an inspirational speaker, thought changer and host of the Divorce Goddess podcast. She supports women and men to have a calmer and more confident and emotionally healing divorce experience. She's been featured on the BBC, ITV, Sky, Radio 5 Live and in publications such as Elle magazine, The Telegraph, The Sunday Times and The FT. Fear of having to change their current lifestyle is one of the biggest blockers preventing people from ending unhappy or unhealthy relationships, says Tosh. So in this episode... We're going to be talking about how we can equip ourselves when we're going through a separation with the financial and emotional tools we need to adjust to a new lifestyle and build positive futures apart. With Louise covering the financial and numbers side and Tosh focusing on the emotional journey, this episode is full of tips and advice to help anyone going through a separation. If you loved this episode, then please subscribe and rate us on your preferred listening platform. Right, ladies, let's get stuck in. Now, Lou is a frequent guest on the podcast. So if you haven't already listened to some of her previous podcasts with us, please go back and have a listen. But Tosh is a newbie. So Tosh, tell us a little bit about your professional background. How did you get into the world of divorce? Thank you for having me on here. And yeah, lovely to be here. So my ex and I were hit by global recession and divorce at the same time. And we, I remember being in a friend's kitchen, there were two corporate lawyers and say, they were saying to me, you've got to go after him. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. Whatever's left. And I just remember having this big rock in my stomach. And I just thought as a child of divorced parents as well, I just thought, do you know what? I'm not going to do it this way. I'm going to do it a different way. And I'm literally going to tr- see it as an experiment in kindness. Now, how can I do things? How can I flip things? How can I change the narrative? And I just after a, a phone call saying can't pay the rent because we couldn't pay up buy we couldn't sell our family house because we had a mortgage. I mean it's all tied up in the financial stuff. And I remember sitting there writing a blog thinking, divorce goddess, thinking, oh, if I'm feeling like this, others might be too. And then mindfulness helped me enormously deal with anxiety and stress. And so much so I trained to be an MBSR mindfulness based stress reduction teacher and coach. And people were just saying, can you help me with this? And I just started getting contacted and I was on the press. And that really just stemmed from there. So I come from a very sort of mindful approach and using my experience of divorce as well. And to really encourage people that there is a more amicable way forwards. And we just have to trust in ourselves that we can do this and not listen to the a lot of noise that's out there telling you otherwise and that, you know, it's worth taking that step forward. So that's kind of where it's come from and my coaching. That's wonderful. Well, we definitely think there is a more amicable way forward. And I certainly remember in my early days of getting divorced, the anxiety that the numbers created for me as well, having not been particularly interested or focused on that. So Lou, let's start with you then and looking at the numbers. Tell us a little bit about whether or not people are just like me, very naive about the numbers, or whether there is a different way of doing things. 
Definitely. And people don't talk about money anyway, do they? It's a taboo subject. And if we were in the United States, people would be going, how are your stacks going? You know, and they, and they are talking about money all of the time. So actually, at any point in your life, t- to talk about and think about your finances is a big step for some people. So when you're going through a change in your life, it, it's an even bigger step. And what people tend to do is put their head in the sand because they're fearful of it. They don't understand it. And this is exactly the time, if not before, to start to gain an understanding of your finances, even if it's boring to you and you're not interested. And people say to me, don't worry about that. My wife or my husband always handles the finances. I trust them. I don't need to know. Let me tell you, when you go through any kind of a change in your life, then you will wish that you had have that understanding. So I encourage people to do it, to do it now, regardless of where they are in their lives. And just start by making, you know, a list of what you have. What's the house worth? If you've got another property, what's that worth? How much is your pension worth? If you've got any savings and investments and and just, you know, if you're visual, draw it in a picture format. It doesn't have to be numbers. Some people hate numbers. So whatever works for you, gain that understanding and, and map it out. And then have a look at your ins and outs. What comes out of the bank? Is there anything that you don't need to be paying? Maybe you'll save some money by going through this process. And I promise you, whoever does it, yes, it's sometimes a bit depressing. And if it's not your thing, you might not particularly enjoy it. But once you've done it, you'll feel better and you'll be in a better position to move forward with any sort of negotiations you might be doing, especially in divorce. So, Tosh, it feels like then that's a big adjustment to a new way of life coming, isn't there? And when you're starting to do those negotiations, you're at the very beginning of that adjustment. Just talk us through, Lou's talked about it in terms of where you might be starting from a numbers perspective. Where are we starting in the emotional journey? Well, I always liken divorce and separation to sort of going down that rabbit hole and you sort of find yourself in a world where nothing is as it seems anymore. And, you know, every time you feel like you've got it right, or you might know and using your experience from before, you're then taken sort of into another room and it's different. And and I think for many people, and particularly I'm going to speak for women because that's my experience, what Lou was saying was super helpful, but it is that whole sense of shame, of failure, of like, where do I start? I'm going to be judged and feeling embarrassed because you don't know. And maybe you've got to the age and you're, you know, between 45 and, you know, whoever, which, whichever age where you are in that place and thinking, God, you know, where do I start? And feeling if, you know, everything else is completely falling around you is actually having that, finding that confidence to reach out and ask for help. And I think the one thing I'm sure both of you would agree with me, is that don't be fearful about being judged. Don't be fearful about not having the information that you feel you should be having or somebody's asking you for. And just know that, you know, every day is a new day to start and it's okay. And I guess, you know, this whole fight, flight, freeze thing, if you're feeling in fear about money, you know, you might have, or you're in fight mode, you might be angry, and Kate, you alluded to that at the beginning, you know, and if you're in flight mode, you're feeling anxious. And if you're in freeze mode, it's, you know, you're exhausted, because the other thing is about divorce is like, it is just relentless and exhausting. So putting all of that on as well, and then having to make decisions about something you don't know about. And I speak for those clients and and people who, I mean, I was kind of that person. So I really speak from experience of actually going, where do I start? How do I start? It's huge. We know, don't we, that in kind of counseling psychology, the worst thing you can do with an anxiety is to sort of play into that and avoid and have that avoidance behavior. And I, I know certainly myself going through it. Once I actually took that deep breath, stepped off the edge of the cliff and started to immerse myself in some of the detail, it definitely got better. But it's just taking that first step, isn't it? And I guess that's the point at which maybe, Louise, that a financial planner can really help 
I guess that's where, you know, actually having somebody alongside you can be a really positive way of moving things forward, especially if your partner is more financially confident, perhaps is chomping at the bit a bit more, finds this stuff easy, can, you know, chuck out a spreadsheet without batting an eyelid and all of that kind of stuff. I guess if you've then got somebody who can come alongside and say, let me lead you through, that becomes quite important. So what does a financial planner do in those circumstances? How can it help somebody that Tosh has described who's kind of at the beginning of that divorce process, rabbit in the headlights, feeling all the anxiety? Yeah, and you're right, Kate, about speaking to somebody about where you're at and sharing it. A financial planner is is a good person to speak to, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the first starting point. I'll just give you an example. I had um, a lady contact me just last week and her sister, actually she's got through to the end of her divorce and now she's got to take control of her finances. And she's dyslexic, this lady. So finances is not her go-to thing, you know. So her sister has contacted us and we're working as a team to help her to see this clearly as to where she is. And, and what we do as financial planners is we get to really understand the people that we work with where they are now and where they want to be in the future and what might happen along the way and what the obstacles might be and also their life intentions. What do they want out of their life? Because if we're talking about someone who's gone through the process, there's there's life beyond that. So yes, it's really important whilst you're going through a change in your life, such as divorce, but it's looking beyond that. And so it's surround yourself with people who are on that journey, who can help you, you feel that you can talk to. And if you do have a good financial planner who can help you to look at those numbers in the round and forecast them forwards, then that will help to give you a degree of clarity, but also take away the fear of the future. That's the thing. It's the fear. And if you do have obstacles to overcome, in my experience, at least if you know they're coming and they're around the corner and you accept that they're there, maybe you have to downsize the house in in a few years, for example, then it's easier to accept and cope with. I guess that's the thing, isn't it, Tosh? Because a lot of this is about having to adjust to a new reality. And sort of psychologically and emotionally speaking, that's that's really tough, isn't it? You've tied up your hopes and dreams and perhaps a large part of your life with a certain vision or destination or a retirement or whatever it is, or raising kids. And then all of a sudden, you're in a very different financial situation. What is going through people's heads then? What's the that, what's that emotional journey around having to adjust? How does that play out? So it's interesting because when you said at the beginning about sort of, you know, you've got to take that step off the cliff. For me, it's all about creating that sort of all important Ural pathway. So instead of that's what kind of reminded me when you mentioned that it's like, so you can either step off the cliff or I kind of, you know, show a visual with clients where you actually you have a choice always and you can drop into that neural pathway and and it gets deeper and deeper the more you fall into it because you're choosing to do what you've always done or you can stand at the top and go, okay, I have a choice. I can either reach out and ask for help. I can ask somebody like my sister if they, you know, and take that brave step. And when you do, it's almost like you're picking up a bucket of sand and you start filling in that neural pathway. And you have a choice. You either can keep falling in and making it deeper or you can go, actually, no, I'm going to step up for myself, step off that cliff, be brave, ask for help and, and start filling this in and creating a new one, which is every time you do do something that is brave and courageous. And I talk about stepping out of your comfort zone which is actually for me is your discomfort zone because it's where you're small and stepping out of your supposed discomfort zone is really where the magic happens because when you say yes to yourself and you have that courage to move forwards that's when the magic happens in life you know that's when you get help that's when somebody you know takes your hand and says I'm going to make it easier for you and I think the whole thing about divorce for me is it's that choice always. You can either feel it's something that's being done to you or you can go, actually, do you know what I'm going to see in this as an opportunity to start to do things differently, to start doing things for me, to empower myself, to really grow into who perhaps I once was before everything started 
falling down that slippery slope. And I feel finance is a really important part. And it was really interesting what Lou was saying earlier about, you know, in America, and I suppose, yeah, I work with American clients and you just kind of go, oh my goodness me. But they have such a different perception of money and that whole sort of Victorian thing we've all got, like, Shh, sh- don't mention money. And I love that people are, you know, more inclined and, you know, ready to step forward and feel empowered about money. I think this is what's really important. So do you think it's a cultural thing then, Tosh, where we've got into a situation where talking about money has become a big taboo and that leads to, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? We talk about it less. So unless we get it instinctively, then it just becomes more of a difficult conversation to break into. Is it a social thing as much a cultural thing? Yeah, I think it's social and it's generational as well. It's, you know, what did you hear as a child growing up, you know? What with that, you know, or money's or money's money grows on trees or what doesn't grow on trees and, you know, money's bad. And it's that whole sort of, you know, how you see money. And I think it's um, on a much deeper level than just, you know, I think it's well, cultural as well. But I think generationally, it's how people perceive money and move forwards. And it's very mm. obvious the clients that have had some input from parents who have helped them, who've supported them and, and education educated them and there is a lot more about happening about education and particularly for women as well which is amazing I think that's definitely affected and influenced your relationship with money um you're right Tosh starts when you're age seven so you see your parents so if you have parents that don't talk about money or they argue about it they're not open about it then you develop that as you're moving through your life you have that relationship so we have to all remember with our kids and grandchildren or whatever that we we need to be all embracing with money don't make it taboo and start the education younger because then they're more likely to talk about money and maybe that's why in the US they haven't necessarily got that issue because they're so used to their parents hearing them talk about their money their businesses and you know it's okay to fail in business over there um, you know, it's almost, um, you know, a badge of, of honour. Yeah, rite of passage, yeah. Yes, it is. So we have to be careful. And so sometimes when we're asking the people that we work with to consider their finances, if they have got an unhealthy relationship or a nervous relationship with money, we have to be mindful of that and take it very carefully. Other people are really empowered to the point, want to get straight on it, and you have a different communication style with them. So I think it's really important that, you know, as a team, and we all, we, you know, we all work with different people at different stages, that we embrace that and we work along with their style and how they want to communicate and get themselves through to the other side. And on that point about children then, Louise, when you're going through a divorce and you're having to plan for children and the costs of children and how money works with them, what sort of things do people have to take into account when they're going through a divorce scenario when it comes to kids? Yeah, people seem to think about the now. So how much is it, you know, for the dinner money or school buses or or uniform? They, They will look at what's happening now, but often they forget to think about what's coming up. So if you think about my two boys, driving lessons weren't cheap. Luckily, they passed first time. And then when they do pass, God, God forbid, you've got the car and they don't want an old banger like I had in, in my day, you know. And then you've got the insurance, which is more than the car. And then you've got university potentially, depending on what they're doing in their lives. And, and then it, this is a different generation. The kids of today are different to what we all were. So I encourage people to have those conversations now to say, right, what's going to happen when there's a marriage in, uh, you know, or, or a university? Who's going to fund it? You might not know now, but at, but at least you've talked about it and you might have a sensible conversation to say, well, actually, we'll jump that hurdle when we get to it, but let's agree that we'll do half each and depending on budgets and finances at the time, it might not be something that you, you write into an agreement. Kate might say you write it in or, or whatever, but at least if you've talked about it, there'll be hopefully some sort of recollection that you've touched on that. And otherwise, the fear will come in again when the bill comes for the driving lessons, because you will be fearful about asking the question about who's going to fund it. And then you, it could promote arguments and disagreements. So that's what I would suggest. And Tosh, do you think then, so that 
early work you do so that you're not stepping off the cliff, but you are building a more confident self that can deal with money and, and talk about money. It sounds like from what Louise is saying is that if you've built that from the beginning, then the chances of being able to resolve some of these issues, because you're right, Lou, you can't always write the unforeseen into a consent order, for example, can you? It's just impossible to write every eventuality in. But then if you've got that better understanding of yourself, that confidence with money, you've done that sort of retraining of the perhaps old cycle of thinking, does that enable you then to be more confident in dealing with the unforeseen? Is it a long-term kind of capability you're building, Tosh? Is that really what this is about? Yeah, I think it's a real sort of, it's a relate. I talk about sort of relationship resilience and it begins with you. So it's really sort of taking, you know, building your foundations well. And every time you say yes to yourself, it's almost like you're metaphorically putting a, a you know, another foundational stone in as well. And, you know, we remember, we remember the times, you know, noting that you did well. So I kind of always encourage everybody to adopt a practice of daily gratitude. So you're, you're marking these wins as well. And then the mind of monkeys, the divorce mind monkeys are kind of like, ah, oh, we remember this one. This one isn't too scary. And I feel that, I mean, one of the big things that was interesting that has come up many, many times is the sort of disparity between households and how, you know, some, families can, or some, or one half of the parents can pay for lots of things, perhaps they have a better job and, you know, and that sort of the fear and the worry that some parents have that they can't provide the same for their children. And this was something that came up, you know, I was kind of just reading through the notes about this particular topic. And, and I just feel that the more you build your resilience, the more you can see when you're going to go into that fight, flight, freeze mode, is that you can observe your worries. You can say, listen, I'm not going to get upset because my children go on a big holiday or whatever every year with my ex, but I'm just going to love the fact that we all go and have an amazing camping holiday with a bunch of friends. And, and just knowing, I think the more you say yes to yourself, the more braver you get, the more you are better able to manage those bumps in the road. Because the thing is, with children, as we all know, is when you have children, you go through a divorce, you're kind of with each other for a life on some, you know, level, and it's not going to go away. So it's like the sooner you kind of do the work with help, of course, to sort of build your strong foundations, the, 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 you know, the, the easier it is to continue building as well. And, and I just would say that the sooner you start, investing in you, whether it's with, you know, whoever is around in your support squad going through separation and divorce, the better. And I know some people sort of push back, I can do it. But the more you're dropping into those negative neural pathways, the deeper they're going to get and the harder they're going to get out. It's going to take to get out. And unfortunately, that is kind of, you know, part of life, isn't it? No matter what you're going through. And, but I do think with children, particularly, it's good to get yourself into a good place if you're worrying about money is to really, for example, like doing morning check-in. I always suggest if you're going through a period where you're uncertain about outcomes, how are you going to manage in the future, just do a morning check-in. And I sort of use the ac an acronym, say the word properly, HALT, which is based on HALT with an I in. So it's hungry, angry, ill, lonely, tired. You know, how am I feeling before I have these conversations with my ex, before I go into mediation, before I, you know, do any work around my divorce, or before I sit down and start looking at the the for me in inverted commas, you know, and just be, you know, how can I look after myself? How can I be gentle with myself while going through, you know, these particular aspects of divorce, which are tough and necessary. And it doesn't have to be, I guess, does it, that you do this in isolation? You know, we tend to fall into the habit of talking about individuals in a divorce, but there's obviously two people and a lot of the work that we do is working with couples. And so Lou, from your perspective, you can do financial stuff together, can't you? It doesn't have to be just because you're divorcing that all of a sudden there's Chinese walls between a couple. They can't share financial information or whatever. I guess that's part of the beauty of working in this way, isn't it? It's better to do negotiations together as a couple. 
It is difficult, but it's it's workable, and we see it happen. And it's open conversations. And um, if there are issues, you can deal with them as a couple. It saves time. You can throw the elephant into the room rather than bottling it up. Deal with it if you can. And of course, especially if there's children involved, there's life beyond. And if you can stay amicable, you can agree a, a settlement that works for you both. Usually, if there's pain on both sides, probably about right. And the other thing is working with couples, often you have social groups in common. And that's a difficult thing, isn't it? Because post-divorce, it's, you know, who, who, do, who do they go to? But I think that if you're seen to be going through these negotiations together, it's more likely potentially you can keep that support group intact. And I think that's really, really important moving forward because one of the points that I was going to make is that life's different. Don't try to keep up with the life you had before. Most people can't. The people with lots of money that can, but most people can't and they need to change their lives and I've seen people try to keep up with their group of friends who dine out all the time and then money issues start to become maybe not immediately but down the line so life's going to change and as you said Tosh you know it might be that you're going on a camping holiday instead of two weeks in Mauritius or or whatever but it's really realizing what's important in life and I'm sure the work Tosh that you do with your clients they get to see this because Investing in yourself is just as important as investing in your finances. And it's a bit like compound interest and how that works. So it's incremental interest and it grows and you become more empowered. And it's the same with learning about your finances. So it's, it's those small, sweet steps. Um, if, it's, if you're someone who's not normally used to the finances, you don't have to do it all at once. You can take it in bite-sized size chunks. And to see it as an opportunity just to jump in there, like to really learn a valuable life skill. It's like, wow, you know, this opportunity has presented itself to me rather than going, oh, my goodness me, I can't do this. Yeah, I suppose it's you always feel a bit nervous about trying to encourage people to look on the bright side when it's something which feels so catastrophic. But I guess what you're saying is you can reframe it. It doesn't have to be all lovely and happy clappy but it still can be a positive opportunity to do things in a different way and to uncover and to learn new skills whether that's about budgeting or planning financial planning or whatever it is and I guess as well you can work some of this out with your friends and family because they are often the people that you go to and talk to and we have a a kind of a, a, a campaign at the moment where we're trying to help friends and family know what the right thing to say is because your natural instinct as a friend or a family member is to try and protect the person that you love and sometimes in trying to do that you can give quite divisive advice so I think there's a need isn't there for us to talk a bit more about how you have those conversations with your loved ones and just moving away from the idea that they need protecting at all costs and they should go and lawyer up and make sure they get the best advice and make sure they uh, you know, are able to stand up to their ex. I think that kind of battle language, that divisive language isn't helpful. And for lots of people, it's not even a reality. The reality for lots of people now is that they can have quite positive conversations. And yes, there are those anxiety-provoking emotions. There is the fear. But there are different ways of dealing with fear rather than hunkering down with your friends and, you know, sort of drawing the battle lines. I mean, Tosh, what do you think about how friends and family can help? So something I encourage, Kate, is for couples, either both, to write a set of intentions or commitments to themselves. They keep themselves on their true north throughout the process. If they're having a wobbly day and they're feeling a little bit fighty or scrappy, they can kind of just refer back to this document. It's almost like, you know, maybe if they want to sign it or share, you know, write them separately together and invite each other to maybe contribute or write their own. And then when it's kind of agreed, you've got like a framework on which to start moving forwards. And if that works for both of you and you both agree, then I suggest they share it with friends and family so everybody knows where everybody is coming from. And there's no wriggle room for 
you know, anything unpleasant. There's there's actually a document for them to say, actually, we're going to call you out because good friends do do that, we hope still. And they can kind of direct you back to your commitment to talk about things constructively, to look after yourself so you're well prepared for a meeting and not sort of like hangry and, you know, the rest of it. And I think genuinely people really want to help. I mean, and but they don't often know how, especially if they don't have experience of divorce. And and I think it's a it's almost like a gift to yourself, both of you as a couple and to your family and friends to have some framework together or some blueprint on which to, you know, pad and start rebuilding the rest of two lives out of. So that would be my, you know, my thoughts and recommendation. And Lou, when it comes to the money side of things, I mean, family are often very involved, aren't they, when we come down to settlements and there's often some kind of loan or there's some kind of cash flow easing from a parent or or a family member. So what role from your perspective do friends and family pay? Well, I think it's important that you choose the right friends or family to share with or to have on your journey because you don't want to really hunker up with someone who's just gone through the most acrimonious divorce because they might still be angry. So you need to really think about your situation. And of course, what I see is that grandparents are the ones that really feel very vulnerable because they still want to have a relationship with their grandchildren. And if they see a split, that can be challenged. So the role of that wider family is to help the couple and to encourage the couple to negotiate amicably with their help. And yes, as Kate says, sometimes they can help financially. And if they help financially in a positive way, rather than, you know, tens of thousands of pounds going in in court fees and, and lawyers, then there's more for the family. And you could argue then for there's more ultimately for time to be spent with the grandchildren, etc., So it's the same with friends, really. Make sure that the people that you have on your journey are those positive ones, are those friends that don't have an agenda, that are not trying to relive their divorce through you and get a better result because they didn't. We see that happen. And don't listen to people at the pub who said, oh, I did this and I did that. But, you know, we've, we've we've had that before. And take control of your own destiny. It's yours. It's not somebody else's life. It's you. And the whole thing, Tosh, about life intentions and goal setting, and we really encourage people to do that. It might not be a monetary thing, but there's life after this. You might want to learn a new language. You know, you might want to play a musical instrument. You might want to have a sporting achievement. It's just having a vision as to what it might be and and have the people on the bus. It's like business, isn't it? You're running a business. You surround yourself with people who are positive and, you know, you work with people and clients included that share your ethics values and you're on, you're on the same bus and you do that in your That's really as well. good advice, isn't it? Because you're right, you, you need an environment where positive oxygen and energy are being put into your sort of breathing space, don't you? Not where you've got people's bad luck stories. And I always think that when we look at forums and things as always whenever you go on these divorce forums there's always such a lot of anger there and it's it's really not very helpful so yeah trying to just keep that energy positive and just some acceptance from the people that are around you but I love the idea of goal setting just personal goals and financial goals and I think once you're at the sharp end of the divorce and you know what the settlement is going to be you have such a brilliant opportunity then to think differently about what your new financial goals are going to be, where your life is going to go, and to be able to marry those two things because you're at that sort of perfect crossroads, aren't you, where you're saying goodbye to one life, you're saying hello to another life, and that other life is going to have goals and objectives and fulfilling elements to it. So I really like that. Any final tips before we go, ladies? Tosh, what would your sort of tips be around setting up for a new life, being at that crossroads, understanding what a new life's going to bring? I think the one thing that comes to mind just in terms of the conversation we've had today is that I think so often people focus on the final figure as being all they have for the rest of their lives. And actually my golden rule is don't make that your final figure. 
you know, it doesn't matter whether you're 60 or whatever, you just don't know what is going to happen in life. And I think, you know, no matter what's happened in this crazy world of ours, you know, nobody really knows what's going to happen in life. And to actually have start, as Lou said, to sort of start planning and start putting some stuff on a board, you know, just putting some ideas about, you know, holidays you'd like to go on, places you'd like to visit, experiences, you know, learn to cook different foods. It can just, it doesn't have to cost money. It could be just, you know, joining a local hiking group and getting fitter and, but it just to think of it as an opportunity, you know, you have this all before you and it might feel hard, but actually it's all okay. Well, culturally, we're taught that the end of a relationship is a failure, when actually it doesn't have to be, does it? The end of a relationship can be a new beginning. And I guess that's what has been the sort of spirit of this podcast episode, hasn't it? The fact that you're at a crossroads, it is a new beginning. It won't look like the path that you're on. It will look like something totally different. But there are so many opportunities to embrace within that. Go on then, Lou, final word to you. <laughs> So if you're a divorcing couple, don't do it on your own. Don't do it on your own. Get some help, get some advice. I and mean, we've got the dream team here, haven't we, if we're, if we're looking at, you know, this particular podcast. Don't do it on your own. Work with someone who, you know, you feel happy with, whether that's a coach, financial planner, you know, work with someone who can help you get through to the other side. And I have been through it myself. I know there's life beyond the benefit that we get as financial planners is we get to see people living that life. And it's it's so wonderful when they say, actually, that happened for a reason. I wasn't meant to be divorced. I wasn't meant to be with that person. We weren't meant to be with each other forever. And then life begins again. It's a new chapter. And I have to say, having been through it, the next chapter is pretty exciting. Well, I hear, hear that. <laughs> Now, ladies, where can people find you? Tosh, where can people find you if they want to find out more about your philosophy on divorce and how you start your new life? Uh, you can find me at www.toshbritton.com. I'm just in the process of rebranding and changing my website. So it's slightly different to Divorce Goddess, or you can listen to me on the Divorce Goddess podcast. Uh, or I'm on Instagram as Divorce Goddess. Wonderful. Thank you. And Lou? Um, so you can find me and my team on worldwideweb.piersfieldoliver.com or you can find me on Twitter at, at Louise Oliver PO and I'm also on Instagram. And if you pop my name into Google, I will pop up with all the various things um, that I've been involved with. Wonderful. Thank you. And you can find out about me on Twitter. I'm at Kate underscore daily and you can hear about new podcast episodes by following at divorce underscore podcast. And if you've liked this episode, please feel free to subscribe where you get your usual podcasts at we are the divorce podcast.com. Thank you very much, both of you for joining me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and thank you everyone for listening. <laughs> <laughs>